people often say, when did you go to Auschwitz? I said, I did not go to Auschwitz. I was taken to Auschwitz. And there is a big difference. Eva Moses Kor was only six years old when her picturesque village of Ports, Romania, was forever changed by the occupation of the Nazi armed guard. Four years later in 1944, her family, father, mother, two older sisters, and twin sister Miriam, were told to gather their belongings. They, along with other Jewish families in the region, were shipped to the infamous Auschwitz Nazi death camp. We were ripped apart from the family within 30 minutes. My sister and I became part of a group of children, 13 sets of twins. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that tattooed its image. So I became capital A-7063. My twin sister became capital A-7064. Eva and Mariam were forced to partake in the horrific experiments of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Interested in understanding the nature of twins, Mengele subjected the sisters to daily measurements, blood draws, and injections. These experiments were not dangerous, but they were awfully demeaning, and even in Auschwitz, I couldn't cope with the fact that they treated me like I was a nothing or a nobody. After one of those injections, I became very ill. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He looked at my fever chart, never examined me, and he declared, laughing sarcastically, too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. I knew he was right, but I refused to die. That fierce determination helped Eva endure until the camp's liberation on January 27, 1945. Of the approximate 3,000 twins that passed through Auschwitz, only about 200 children survived. In the now famous footage showing the liberation, Eva and Miriam can be seen leading the other twins to freedom. Years later, that same picture prompted Eva to wonder, what happened to the children after the liberation? She and her sister committed themselves to locating the other Mangala twins. I was embarking on something that I wasn't sure what I was doing. I was very passionate about it. And it was like discovering a eureka moment. When we found another survivor, we would call each other. We found another one. And it became a very important thing to us. We realized that we found another piece of who we were as a group of children. Through their foundation, Candles, they were able to locate 122 survivors living in 10 different countries on four different continents. In August of 1989, she and a group of 60 other survivors took the difficult step to return to Auschwitz. Since then, Eva has continued to revisit the camp, both for healing and to provide education. I often say that the soil of Auschwitz is soaked with the tears, the ashes, and the blood of our families. And at times I wondered, did it really happen? Or could that be some fruit of my imagination? I needed to verify, validate my memories. So I always wanted to go back to Auschwitz. When I go to Auschwitz, this is where I'm the closest to my family. The selection platform, which is always my focus of my trip. In some way, it's my cemetery, because this is a place I saw my parents for the last time and my sisters. I want to reclaim my life with all its joy that was taken away from me. So I dance the whole around the selection platform. I should not be deprived to enjoy life wherever I want to. I get interesting looks from kids. You cannot do that here. I said, you know what? I can do anything I want. I have earned the right. In 1993, her effort to reclaim her life took an unexpected turn. Hoping to gain information on the experiments, she agreed to meet Dr. Hans Munch, a Nazi doctor and friend of Mengele's. 
Though he had little knowledge to offer, he did provide crucial eyewitness testimony on the gas chamber operations, speaking willingly in contradiction to those who denied the atrocities of the Holocaust. I saw that that was very kind of him. I had no idea how to thank a Nazi. And actually, I went to the local Hallmark shop, looked for hours in the thank you section, hoping that I get some ideas of thanking this Nazi doctor. And a simple idea popped into my mind. How about a letter of forgiveness from me to him? I knew immediately that he was going to find that a meaningful gift. But what I discovered for myself was life-changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. Mengele, the Nazis, Hitler have no longer any power over my life. That peace, however, was devastated on June 6, 1993, when Eva's sister Mariam passed away. Wanting to do something in her honor, Eva opened the Candles Museum in 1995. Candles served as Indiana's only Holocaust museum until 2003, when a tragic case of anti-Semitism turned to arson. I was going to rebuild it even if I have to use the last penny I have in my pocket. I am not going to let hatred win. I always felt that it was very important to inform the world about that little but very dark and hidden chapter of the Holocaust. It was for me important for the world to know how does it feel to be a child in Auschwitz. I can tell you that we were more deprived than any other human being on the face of that earth. If one's childhood is filled with memories of chimneys belching and smelling, to die was not that difficult. It was very easy to die, and the Nazis were interested, obviously, in killing us. So how does one survive that and make a life? So that is what I want to tell people, what can we learn from children who thrived over adversity and over nightmares and over unbelievable evil. But I don't think remembering is enough because I want people, in spite of everything, they should be able to celebrate their life and forgive and heal. And I always tell people it's probably the most amazing thing. It costs nothing. Everybody can afford it, yet it has such a tremendous effect for good in people's lives. When they forgive, they are no longer victims. They are survivors who are in charge of their own life and not a victim of their past.